great innovation stories make change possible. Each week on the Innovation Storytellers podcast, I invite innovation leaders to share how they overcame the obstacles to introduce breakthrough ideas to the world through the power of story. I'm featuring guests from Tesla, TD Ameritrade, Corning, Cisco, Bloomberg, and so many more. Listen in to learn how you can tell a more effective innovation story and change the future for the better. Hey everyone, it's Susan Lindner. I'm back and welcome to another fantastic episode of Innovation Storytellers. I am beyond thrilled. And I say beyond very rarely on this show because it's rare that we have someone on this show who understands all facets of that innovation diamond. And I want to introduce you today to my very special guest, Kapil Kane. And Kapil is the Director of Innovation at Intel China. Just a small job, the Director of Innovation at Intel China, where he co-founded and runs GrowthX, which is an award-winning corporate startup accelerator. And we're going to spend the bulk of our time talking about that today. Over the past 20 years, Kapil has designed and launched world-class products and businesses at the intersection of arts and design and technology. He is the creator of the first multi-touch screen at Apple. Kapil went on to lead product design on the iPod, MacBook Air, iMac, and eventually even our very favorite iPad. Kapil has deep expertise in the areas of technology, innovation, and entrepreneurship through advising startups and engaging with leading accelerators, universities, and GOs around the world, as well as speaking at large global conferences. Kapil was born and brought up in the tiny seaside province of Goa, which is the place in India I would most like to visit. By the way, Kapil completed his bachelor's degree in India and went on to receive a master's degree in engineering from Stanford and eventually finding his way back to Asia in Shanghai, where he has been living with his family. So Kapil, welcome to Innovation Storytellers. It is an honor to have you on the show today. Thanks for having me, Susan. It's a pleasure to have a chat with you on this topic of innovation. Yes. Well, at the edge of our seat, as we are waiting to hear some of the fantastic stories about how innovation moves through large organizations like Apple, like Intel. And so I ask all my guests who come on, how did you even come to this place of innovation? No one majors in innovation in college, right? It winds up being a byproduct of something that lives inside of us that wants to move things forward at a pace maybe the rest of the world isn't yet comfortable moving. So where did this desire for innovation come from in you? It's funny. I didn't even know this word innovation. I mean, I knew what innovation is, but sure. back in the days in like 2000, I think it's 2002, 2003, when I was doing my PhD at Stanford, I went to work at Apple for a summer internship. And the next summer I went back to Apple for the second summer internship. And at that time we were working on this cutting edge technology, which uh, happened to be the touch screen. And that's when I decided to, that this was much more fun than doing research. Uh, and I dropped out of school and joined Apple full-time. And that's how my journey of innovation began. It was not anything planned. It happened just because of the, the sheer amount of learning on the job, trying to solve problems. I think the thing at Apple was that we were given a challenging vision. We were shown something really cool that you could, you that, that you know, hey, we need to get to this place. You figure out how to get there. And that's what innovation meant to us, is finding ways to get to that vision that comes from Steve Jobs, from the concept to Johnny Ive as an industrial designer, and everyone else, like I was a product designer in, in, in traditional term, you can call me a mechanical engineer, the one who designs like the physical things you touch and things like, think of this, like a iPhone, one of the third versions of iPhone, it was all glass on the surface. So any engineer would immediately say, you can never build this because glass is brittle. And why take a risk of building anything with the glass at the surface so that you drop it and it cracks, right? But we had we worked with, I think, with Cornings at the time to create the right kind of glass that was uh, tempered and it wouldn't break and edge treatment. So I think if you show a vision, engineers can come up with ways to 
make that and and you need those engineers to be bought into the vision right so and that's how my innovation journey actually started it is this desire to come up with creative technical solutions to go build amazing products that change the world right so it's like this yes. the steel's reality distortion field kind of sucked me in. I think he sucked yeah. all of us in, by the way. We didn't know any of this was possible, but I can only imagine your parents' response when you told them that you were going to be a PhD dropout and follow your internship dreams into something bigger. <laughs> Just kind of curious for our younger listeners out there, um, what did mom and dad have to say about leaving the program? <laughs> uh, I think um, I had enough credits to get a master's degree, so I didn't go empty-handed. So at least, you know, <laughs> the I had that consolation. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I think they might see some ROI on that investment at some point, right? Your mom and dad, they're okay with yeah, it yeah, now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And they came for my graduation, so yeah, they were all good, yeah. So, But definitely, you know, having like a doctor against your name is something different. It was actually kind of not cool at Apple at the time to have a doctor in front of your name because we put them in this research category and we thought we are the cool, the pirates who actually know how to act, like uh, hustle and find ways to make something happen. Yeah, right, so we don't sit around and think about stuff. We actually yeah. get stuff done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, okay, fantastic. Okay, so I'm gonna ask one more Apple question and then we'll move on to all things Intel. But okay. so, I mean, Working on those different, I mean, these are seminal products that changed our lives. They changed the course of human history and how we interact, right? The conversation we have today around the iPhone, for example, is that there is more computing power in an iPhone than there was in the space shuttle. To be involved with those kinds of breakthrough products and the iPad, to physically hold your computer in that tactile way that we would go to bed and fall asleep with our iPad watching a movie right? I mean, it, it becomes close to us and part of us. We FaceTime with people and we feel a connection to other human beings in a way that a phone never could make us feel that way. Can you just tell us a little bit about that process? And maybe Apple is just a different animal than every corporation out there, but the emergence of the idea, the bringing it to life, the getting it to market can you just tell us a little bit about the storytelling that goes on in Apple that goes from Steve Jobs' mind all the way to getting a product out the door? Think of Apple as two parts. One is an execution engine and another is like a creativity powerhouse. And so what happens is we have industrial design lab. Only few people can get in there. Even being a VP doesn't give you an automatic access. It's only for people who need to get in there because... There are tables, there are lots of prototypes like hanging there. Steve and Johnny Ive and Phil Schiller, they used to meet there. They used to look at touch and feel. And everything there starts with a physical prototype. You could, you could draw things on the board. You could help people come in and do keynote presentation. But until you see something in your hand, you know what it feels like. You know what it uh, looks like. The exact weight, you see the exact user interface you will not move forward with that idea. And there are lots of ideas floating around. So just to give an example, right? iPhone was launched in 2007. iPad was launched in 2010. Both have the touch interface. And you remember, I said, I, I dropped out of school to work on a touch interface in right. 2003, 2000, yeah, 2004. And that interface actually was what we're doing is we were building a tablet. So we were actually, we started with, hey, what can we do with this multi-touch user interface? Because until then, the touch screens were resistive touch, like in a one poke, like a stylus. You just poke, 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 blip, blip, blip. And right. being able to slide your fingers and all 10 fingers at the same time and manipulate stuff on the screen, that was revolutionary. And so we we're figuring out what to do with this. And we were, so we just started building prototypes and uh, we showed some prototypes to Steve and it was for a peripheral. We were thinking, hey, it would be a cool thing. It's something like a Microsoft table. It would be yeah. something cool you can have hanging Add around. On. Yeah. yeah. And he said, hey, why don't we make a tablet out of it? And so we went, went back to the drawing board, made it into a tablet, and it went through lots of iterations from imagining, is it something that you are able to type on? Is it something you carry in your pocket? 
And we spent two years on figuring out what it could be. And finally, we made tablet. We made thousands of tablets as and we seeded you know our development teams within Apple to build something on it. But we did not have an operating system. We did not have this concept of App Store. And so we shelved it, shelved the project. We killed the project. Oh, no. um, really? Yeah. 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 However. Oh, I never knew that. Yeah. So, however, at the same time, there was a secret team working on the phone project. And they were figuring out what would be the user interface for the phone. And at that time, the only handheld thing we had was iPod. And so they were going with that like click wheel kind of an interface. And right. Steve did not like it. And the tablets were seated. And one of the UI designer, he took one of our tablets and created this user interface, which is like when you when you take the screen and when you like pull it, it kind of bounces back, right? It's called a rubber band effect. And he showed it to Steve. And that's when he said, okay, maybe this is the right interface for the phone. And the, all the work we had done on the tablet touchscreen went to the phone team. And a year and a half later, that became the iPhone. So you can see that it's not like a planned process. It's not a straight, it's not line. Like, it's not never a straight a line. line. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and it was you know, not until iPhone came in with very simple user interface, very simple few apps. Then the app store came along. Uh, then people got used to this thing of apps. There were developers in. They perfected the operating system. And then... After another three, four years, we came up with the iPad, which was the original vision. And so it's never a linear process. Uh, other thing is why it worked is we, were, is we constantly made prototypes. We constantly killed projects. It was not... So after this tablet, right? After the touch screen, I went to work on many other things. And every project I did was killed. And, and we used to say, oh, that project got canned, right? You say that it got canned. And then it become a joke that they said it got caned, saying like, you know, whatever <laughs> I work on, it gets canned. It so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you became known as the guy with the magic touch. Huh? <laughs> yes. Yeah. So so it was like not until I, I worked on this, the iPod shuffle, that was my very first product that landed into the market. So, wow. so people thinking, looking from outside, they think, hey, yeah, it's a natural thing. Everything is planned properly and it happens TikTok. It's not the case. <laughs> it's very messy inside. And if you keep killing, for example, if they, if like when we showed the very first touchscreen interface to Steve and he said, okay, this is stupid, let's kill it. <laughs> and then there would never have been a touchscreen interface for iPhone, right? So I think that's the something is that every idea may look stupid now. Maybe the time has not come for the idea. So I think you need to keep encouraging your teams to keep innovating, listen to their ideas, give them space to work on their ideas, turn them into something tangible. Because at some point you will like go back. I'm like, oh yeah, we did this three years ago. Let's take a look at it. And maybe it's relevant now. So I think that's the, what happened at Apple. And if you guys are thinking today that Apple is not innovative, they're not doing anything, I guarantee you there's like like dozens of projects working even from building big cars to VR headsets to AR, they're doing it. It's just not ready for prime time. Uh, the end use, prime time. Yeah. yeah. So that's why you don't see it. Yeah. It's fascinating. I only have about 8 million questions circulating through my head right now as you're telling us this. I remember watching the 60 Minutes interview here in the United States with Johnny Ive. And I remember that room very clearly that had all different kinds of blankets draped over those tables. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the interviewer is saying, can we peek under those tables? And Johnny Ive was like, on pain of death. <laughs> like <laughs> This is where all the good stuff, like this was the playland. Mm -hmm for everyone. And the other thing that you mentioned is you and I were speaking right before the show about one of my clients and one of the guests on the show from Corning Glass and ability to look at materials in a whole different way is a game changer. And a 170 year old company like Corning Glass has an innovation archive and library where they routinely delve back into over a hundred years of innovation of all the stuff that got shelved of all the stuff that never made it to prime time. And they go back in there and go, hey, what can we use? What can we make out of this? 
Like, I wonder what's on file in the archive when someone tried this before. Does Apple keep an innovation archive as well so that these brilliant designers can go back in and see what was on the, what got caned and go back and resurface it one more time? I think I left Apple about 10 years ago. And until that time, there was no real corporate system there. It was still like a pirate ship. We and it was even, just Steve Jobs as captain saying, I or nay, like yeah. by fiat. Yeah. And he and his counsel, I mean, he's like Johnny I, Phil Schiller, and what guys Steve like- Steve Wozniak, you know, was he part of this decision-making? No, no, he was not involved at Apple at all, like for many years. Yeah, I think mm-hmm. after, yeah, he was not at all there. Yeah, no. Yeah. No, yeah. So I know we could talk about Apple all day because all of us interact with those products on a day-to-day basis. So it feels very close to our heart, but I do want to shift to Intel and um, doing marketing in the tech space and B2B. I can't tell you how many companies say, give me an example of a company that really knows how to tell their story well, even as a hidden complex technology that operates on the back end that nobody gets to see. And the answer to that question is always, Intel inside, that they people are able to tell the story of Intel. They don't even know necessarily what it, the chip does or what a semiconductor, mm-hmm. how it moves inside of a computer, but they know when they go to buy their computer or better have Intel inside. Mm-hmm. So tell us a little bit about the work that you did on the innovation front. And then I want to dive into talking more about. So, yeah. So I think Intel is a very tech focused company. Most of our employees, at least we have around 10,000 employees here in China. Wow. Uh, yeah. 10,000 in and China. The, okay. Yeah, 10,000 people in China. Yeah, 10,000 employees. And and we have this culture of, great culture of bottoms of innovation, just like this Google's uh, 15% rule, right? So we encourage our employees to tinker in the labs and build something. And we have quite many like programs that seed these innovations. We have many campuses across China and we have many business groups working in China and they have all their different programs for ideation, let's say through hackathons, then seed programs. Then from there, we have collaboration with sales and marketing group and R&D to come up with, see how can we solve user needs. And one thing we saw was that, you know, there were certain gaps and one of the biggest gap we saw about five years ago was there were lots of amazing innovations happening in the labs and we would showcase them to all the visiting executives and they would be like, you know, wow. We had this question, how can we commercialize these cool innovations happening in the lab? And that was the big question given to me. And and that's where, that was the starting point for creating this growth ax, which is an accelerator of innovations at Intel China. So taking the the technical proofs of concept as a base and turning them into validated business cases, which we can turn it into products or solutions and bring to the market. So Uh, Kapil, mm -hmm. when you came to Intel initially, was Mm -hmm. it your job description, let's say, Mm -hmm. to mine the employee base, to find the brilliant hidden gems inside the walls of Intel Mm. and turn those hidden gems into future products, services, Mm. new processes, et cetera. Was that your mandate in coming? It was not actually. I came to Intel to build like an education version of iPad. So that that is what I came to. Okay, right. Okay, let's stop there for a second, right? This is how innovation happens also. So much (laughs) by accident or some other divine design that you and I can't necessarily tap into this moment. But so you... You were to parlay your brilliant expertise in the iPad. And mm-hmm. by the way, at some point, maybe at the end of the segment, we're going to have a conversation about the name iPad and mm-hmm. where that came from. Because I remember working in a naming agency and going, oh my God, who came up with that name iPad? <laughs> but um, <laughs> the number of jokes we made about the iPad um, was I mean, that was the topic of happy hours for weeks. So, (laughs) but so you were intending to create a product. Is that right? At Intel? Uh, Yeah. So I think I'm not sure if uh, you 
know this thing called OLPC, one laptop per child. It was yes, of uh, course, of course, yeah. So it came out of MIT Media Lab, uh, right. Nicholas Negroponte, right? Mm-hmm. So he had this that will create affordable laptops for uh, for for children in underprivileged. It had a green countries. handle, if I remember correctly, yes. right? They're white I, yep, with the green yep. handle. White you and green. Carry them to school with you. Yeah, yeah, I remember. In Africa, yeah. I remember seeing pictures yes. of children. Holding them, sure. Exactly. So, mm-hmm. so, so, so that vision. So, but so he was able to do it as like able to demonstrate that, but he was not able to build it at scale or mm-hmm. with like the right kind of design. So Intel took up that idea and and built a new segment of product called netbooks. So these are not laptops. It's called netbooks, which is a simple same thing as OLPC, a, a simple device that connects to the internet so that you can learn on the go. And so we created this whole business group called Emerging Market Platforms Group to look for what is the next big thing. And we thought that education is a big thing. And we created something called Classmate PC. And Classmate PC was this laptop, like netbook device, which was purpose built for education. It's very rugged. That means you can just like throw it on the floor and it will survive. Uh, and like how and so kids treat I, their shoes. Yeah. When yeah, they come home exactly. from school. <laughs> And, and so when the iPad came along, right? So when the iPad was launched, uh, these kids, they were like, no, I don't want a laptop. I want a tablet. And so uh-huh. Intel wanted to create the like this rugged tablet. And so, and I had spent enough time at Apple. I knew how to design shiny, cool things, how to make Johnny happy. But right? <laughs> we, we always said we are designing toys for rich people. And mm-hmm. I, I thought this was a great challenge to work on something very meaningful and so I came to Intel to design that. And I worked in that group wow. for, I think, three years before I took on this role of doing this innovation. Yeah. So it was not, I came to Intel to teach them how to innovate. It was, I came to build a product. And after I did that, I had this opportunity. And the reason I switched was, it was is also very interesting. When we were doing this, this classmate PC designs, right? The Intel is super global in terms of how they operate as a team. So that means mm. a designer could be in, in Santa Clara. The engineer can be sitting in Bangalore. A marketing guy can be sitting in Shanghai. So it's all like spread over. The teams are very virtual. And for this education team, the design was done out of Shanghai. The engineering was done out of Shanghai. The product design was done out of Shanghai, but all the, the UI, ID, marketing, product planning was done out of the US. And I had this problem of getting my ideas across to the guys making the decisions because Mm -hmm. they were far away. We were far away from them. So it's like out of sight, out of mind. I'm in HQ, you are in a like geo. And I had this frustration of not getting all my ideas across. And I actually wanted to leave uh, Intel and do something else when this opportunity came along. And when they explained to me that I see many amazing innovations coming here, but they don't get anywhere. I could empathize with those people, our employees who have great ideas, but their ideas just die in the lab. And that's why I stayed on and I took on this challenge saying, okay, let's do something about this. I've been facing this issue for the last year and a half. And it's a, it's a way things happen, change things. And so that's why I took on this role. And GrowthX was not born right from the beginning. We were just figuring out how can we support these innovations? How can we give them some business coaching? We brought in some coaches to, we tried multiple things until like two years into the program, we said, hey, let us just build an accelerator, just like how startup accelerators are outside. But this is, instead of startups, these are all our internal innovation teams. And so that's how the growth X was born. Wow. It's fascinating how this comes to be, right? Which is a reminder for us is this is also how the process of innovation just works, right? Whether we're dealing with humans or whether we're dealing with products, was it a hard sell in order to tell folks, tell upper management that we actually need an internal sourcing mechanism to generate and hold on to and develop these brilliant ideas and these brilliant thinkers inside of Intel? Was that a hard sell? Because I'm sure there's lots of listeners going, why don't we have a growth X in our business? I think it's a hard sell in the sense of it, just to get the program off the ground. 
was difficult. Although we had buy-in from the top management, like from the Intel China CEO, because I, you know, so I worked in his office, right? But Ooh. then the, the issues are with the middle management, like where the, when you start implementing things, those are the most challenging things. I think the most challenging thing in innovation is not the idea not the vision, but executing on it, like going step by step. But I hear this over and over again on this show is that the greatest detriment to great innovation is the middle manager. Mm -hmm. And yet no one is innovating the middle manager. I mean, when you're at Apple, you have order by fiat, right? You have Caesar mm -hmm. sitting on his throne saying yay or nay to whichever project comes along, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. They have a clear sense, but then there are the middle managers who have to execute. And they're also thinking about their career, their growth potential, their path, keeping mm -hmm. everyone in line. We just are working on this new project. Now he's throwing another project at me. I've got to scale that thing too. Is there something in your learning about putting together this award-winning corporate startup accelerator that says, how do we deal with the middle class of middle managers who are the greatest speed bump in the process? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. Okay. It takes yeah. time. It takes patience because you need to win them over no matter of I logical. Won? Or is it a culture yeah. thing? Uh, no, it's kind of, it's kind of a both. So I'll tell you what. Okay. So when we started this accelerator, right, we said, hey, we will pick up five teams at a time. And those five teams uh, will be located inside our accelerator, which we run from outside of Intel. We run from a startup hub, okay, like a, a co-working space. And so we're like, okay, for three months, they are all ours, give it to us. And then you take them back after three months if they want to come back. But then the, all these like managers, they got scared. They're like, no, you can't do that. And this growth X was going to like just go down. But we said, okay, let's do this. Let's do one, one day per week. It's, it's the innovation day. And so we got them for one day a week. And then we that's how we started our like in our first batch. The second batch, same thing, one day a week. And we run these batches. We run two batches a year. And as we went through like fourth batch, fifth batch, maybe on the fourth batch, I remember actually batch number five is when we had the very first big success that an idea from our accelerator became a very big product launch. And, and then they're like, okay, these guys can actually do something. And so the, in the following batches, now the managers would allow these guys to work full-time. On top of that, they would even add more resources onto the project. They said, hey, if GrowthX picks you, I'm going to double down on it. You know, I'm going to put wow. more people on it. I'm going to put more money on it. So and that so now I we don't have to negotiate with any manager nothing. I think mostly out of let's say we do 10 to 12 teams a year, out of this I think at least 60% of the teams are working full time with support from their manager. And And what about funding, Kapil? Yeah, we we also give them the funding. We call it the funding to build MVP for business validation. So for example, it could be a technical prototype. It could be landing pages. It could be uh, video demos. It could be holding like a, a workshop for the customers. It could be creating surveys. So the goal is we give them enough money for them to build a prototype and, and do all the different validation testing to work on the business case, not necessarily to as a product development or tech development. So yes, they do get funding to maybe hire interns to hire the contingent workers for a temp like short period of time to provide a quick boost. Yeah. And of course, many times we will also get people from other business units to join in on the project if it if they see a benefit. Yeah. yeah. And so these batches that you had started off with how many people and how how long is the duration where you were stealing people for a day? How long mm. did that go on for? How long do they have to make their proof of concept? We call them it's four months. Total Four months and eight design sprints. We call it not eight business sprints. We have eight sprints. Like the first sprint is like, you know, business model, then value proposition, hypothesis validation, market sizing, blah, 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 all the way to financial modeling, to building the business case and finally pitching and storytelling, right? So, so those each sprint lasts for two weeks. So that's how it's like 16 weeks. And for those 16, one day a week, they are with us. And in the mornings, we do the workshops and in the afternoons, we do one-on-one -on -one coaching with each team. And we have like a, a team set up and we have like a program director, we have acceleration managers, we have entrepreneurs in residence, and we have mentors who are from the ecosystem outside of Intel to help them 
accelerate it as if they are like CEOs there of their own little startup. But these are not outside startups. These are like internal projects, which we call them internal startups. And yes. giving them that, that belief and the support structure, in the end, they are telling a story of why they need another million dollars or $5 million and how that $5 million can will turn into $50, $100 million for Intel. So that's, that's right. what we, in the end, try to get it. So our customers are senior management who are going to champion and sponsor this project. Yeah. 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 So how, (laughs) you know, I know that my reason for being on the planet is to help innovators tell their stories. So they get the resources and the runway and the recognition that they deserve this much. I know for sure. So Mm -hmm. how many times have you seen a great idea fail because the story didn't connect with the people who were going to fund that brilliant idea? What happens when we can't get the story out and as a result, great innovation die? Yeah, that's the tragedy of innovation. Mm. Uh, So this is why I put my arms around great scientists and say, can I just please help you tell the story? Because I don't (laughs) want this beautiful thing to wind up in a lab somewhere and never see the light of day. Well, I know we're coming up on our time together, but I always ask guests these final three questions when they come on the show. So Hmm. I'm going to put you on the hot seat for a moment, Kapu. And I'll ask you this question. So what in your mind is maybe one of the top three innovations of all time, of all time, since human history began? What is one of the greatest innovations in your mind? I think it's a computer, Mm, like a a PC. Yeah. Yeah. With or without internet connection, that's still the PC is still the greatest. Yeah, I think hands down. And I think it what created that was the microprocessor, right? I'm not biased at all. A little bit, but... a little bit. <laughs> so it could be the microprocessor, just saying. <laughs> uh, okay, yeah, so... but you know, I, I, yeah, it's, it's a computing device, you know, it just, yeah. I, I can't imagine what this world would be without like any computing device. And I think personal computer, I think like right now, we would not be able to do this without like a personal computer, right? Although I'm not like a big, techy kind of a fan. I'm not a tech nerd, but I do. I don't use AR, VR. I don't jump onto latest and greatest technology. I'm not like a, not a fan of metaverse or any of those things. I don't, but I do feel this is very practical. I like practical innovation and something also learning. I think I I love to learn and read and without a computer, let's say like a laptop or a, or a tablet, I wouldn't be able to do it. So I think to me, that's the biggest innovation, like at least from my point of view. Yeah. If you could join any innovation team at any time in history, which innovation team would you join? Who would you like to work with? I don't want to work with any innovation team. I want to work on a product team, product design team. Because you know, I think I'm actually very allergic to the word innovation because it's funny, all my years at Apple, we never used the word innovation. And and we just did it. And and I think if we have to like point out something and say, this is innovation. It should be like just something that just natural, you know, just like engineering or whatever, R&D or anything, like just thinking. It's Innovation should be like a skill. Every single person should innovate in, in some way, right? They should innovate in anything they do. If they are not, there's something wrong. So I think I'm, my my passion is to build products, to see products come to life. So I would work in a product team or I would work in a, in a team that helps bring product to life. Like maybe, I, I think investor even, I don't know, but it's maybe it's not for me, but I think definitely product team, yeah. Okay, last question is, if there's an innovation that you'd like to see, a shift, a change in something that you'd like to see, something that drives you crazy or something you have a deep desire to see mm-hmm. exist in the world that doesn't yet exist, what would that be? I think it's not one thing, but I think maybe looking, making things simpler, making things like the way they were, like when we were kids, like being able to interact with your friends, going play with your friends, being mm-hmm. more in the physical mm-hmm. world, rather than all this virtual world going from like always being on a device to doing something in like, like interacting in the physical world. I think those, that's the innovation I would like to see. Also another innovation I'd like to see is going from five day work week to three day work week so that you can have, you're not by design. That's, that, that's what becomes the norm. So you have enough work life balance. Yeah. So I think what I mean is going back to simpler times, but with with better 
connection, better technologies, and better standard of living. For everyone. Not, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, it's amazing to hear a techie go, less tech, please. <laughs> but like you said, <laughs> you're not a techie. So yeah. I w- I'm so grateful for your time today, Kapil. Thank you so much for joining us on Innovation Storytellers. I think we might have to do a part two to this conversation and get in even deeper in some of the growth X companies because they sound so exciting. Sure, it was fun uh, chatting with you. And yeah, I'm up for round two. (laughs) Fantastic. Thank you so much, Kapil Kane, for joining us today on Innovation Storytellers. Uh, Yeah, you're welcome, Susan. And thanks for having me. (laughs) Thank you. Now you might be asking, Susan, why innovation storytelling? Well, the truth is that an innovation story told well not only breaks down communication barriers so you can drive change and new growth, but it also helps other people remember and champion your work. And it propels your best ideas forward faster to secure you the runway, resources, and recognition you so richly deserve. In other words, stories are memory-making devices that significantly reduce the time it takes for you and your innovation to be understood. But like many leaders, you probably never got the memo that storytelling skills would be central to your success. Well, I've got some good news for you. It's not too late because I've got you covered. Whether you need an expert to come and speak to your innovation leaders, you need training in the art and method of innovation storytelling, or you just need the support and guidance of a consultant who can get you where you want to go in less time, visit www.susanlinder.com today to learn more and to set up a call to discuss your needs. I'm so looking forward to connecting with you and to helping you tell a great innovation story. If you like what you heard so far, don't forget to subscribe so you never miss another episode and leave us a comment. Tell us what you think of this episode. We'd love to hear from you. And if you didn't like what you've heard, just forget everything I've said.